I'm sort of troubled this morning. I, I'm hearing voices in my head. They're getting louder and louder, and, and it's more difficult to think. Oh, I heard them ringing in my ears years ago, late 60s, early 70s up in Austin. <laughs> but nothing, nothing like this. They're louder, louder, more clamorous, almost maddening are these voices. Perhaps I ought to back up and let you in on how, how I got to this place. About 25 years ago, I was finishing up my third pastorate in Odessa, Texas. And the parish there had gotten to the size that it was ready for me to go ahead and move on to something else. I'd been in the ministry at that time for 30 years, and I was ready to try something entirely new. So I called the missions board and asked them for a foreign missionary assignment. Shortly after that call, I received it. I was to go to the Far East, and so off I went. And when I got there, it was a beautiful place to be. The mountains were glorious, the foliage fantastic. In the springtime, the flowers were, were so beautiful, it was almost surreal, almost like a Monet painting. And the people there were really nice people. They spoke a form of English, and they drove on the right side of the road some of the time. <laughs> But this indigenous people had some strange habits. One of them that really bothered me is you would see a luxury car out on the street, and in the back window of that car, they would have a roll of bathroom tissue, a box of detergent, and another roll of bathroom tissue. Perhaps you're wondering where this assignment was. It was indeed Far East. It was Alabama. <laughs> The people there indeed were wonderful people, but they worshiped the past. They were looking at the former glories that they knew, longing for a new day. They worshiped at the, their patron saint, St. Paul Bear Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> and then something changed all that about 10 years ago. Actually, the something was someone. His name is Nick Saban. And he's making a salary this year of only $11.6 million. And he's worth every penny of it. <laughs> for for 10 years, they have been competing for the national championship. And what I hear in my head echoing back and forth is, we're number one. We're number one. We're number one. It's maddening, isn't it? Have you ever been to a Bama game? I went to Nashville to see them play Vanderbilt one year. The cars were there with that rear window display, the tissue, the detergent, the tissue. Roll, tide, roll. <laughs> hey, I can't help it, that's what they did. <laughs> there, when we got into the game, were these gargantuan human beings, these young men, mammoth in size, jumping up and down excitedly. The Crimson Tide Band would play the fight song they would come charging out of that tunnel through the paper sign. The people would surge to their feet with that saying, we're number one. We're number one. And they would wave those obnoxious red and white foam fingers in the air. <laughs> You've seen them. A personal aside, when I got back to San Antonio after my time in Alabama, my alma mater played here in the Alamo Bowl. And it was a wonderful experience, though not quite the same. There in the tunnel were some pretty good-sized boys. They were jumping up and down some of the time. The, ca uh, the tra saddle tramps were ringing their cowbells. The Red Raider band was playing the fight song. The mask rider surging down the field with that under that glorious horse, that black and white quarter horse. And we struggled to our feet as our team staggered through the sign. <laughs> and we proclaimed, we're number 12. <laughs> we're number 12. And you know, try as hard as I could, I could not find a foam hand with 12 fingers on it. <laughs> 
Rankings are interesting things, aren't they? We look at them in sports and it's always fun to figure out who's in first place or who the poll writers think are the best. And we do that in our own lives as well. We look at polls for things to help us make decisions. A couple of years ago, I was looking for a new car and I about decided I was going to get the turbo Bentley convertible. <laughs> but then I got the ratings on fuel economy and that tore the deal. I went ahead and got a Ford. <laughs> We do those kinds of things in all areas of our living. We have our personal preferences and we rate things and rank them. I, I know that the women of the church and many of you men as well have your preference for a grocery store. Target, Wally World, or the Hebe. And you pick that one and that's where you go. We go to barber shops or beauty parlors on, that fit our preferences. I find, try to find one that does not charge a finder's fee. <laughs> And, and so we do pick things by, by ratings. 18 months ago, my wife and I found ourselves having to make a serious rating in our life. I had turned 70 years old, and in our book of order, you're out. They put me on the role of honorably retired ministers. That meant I could not continue in the pulpit. And furthermore, I could not go back to the church that I had pastored, for they feared I might somehow interfere with the new pastor. That's a rule universal in the church. And so we were on the street. We were looking for a church home. And there could only be number one, number one, when, in looking for our church home. Our neighbor across the street suggested we go out and hear Max Licato at Oak Hills Non-Denominational Church, and we did. Then our neighbors next door, being true evangelistic people, took us with them to their church, St. Bridget's Roman Catholic Church, and that, that was a good experience. We tried several different flavors, kind of like Baskin Robbins, try one of this and one of that, and we've sort of got our mind set on the Episcopal Church for two reasons. The historic timelessness of the liturgy and the serving of the Eucharist every Sunday. And so we were trying Episcopalian church here in the city, and we tried several of them, fine churches, but somehow they just didn't fit. One Sunday we had decided to try a new church, and as we were beginning to research it on that Saturday morning, I found out they were having a special service that day that would impact their worship. And you know, visitors can be kind of picky, and I really didn't want to go through their special service, I just want to go to church. <laughs> My wife offhandedly said, I hear there's an old church near downtown that has glorious stained glass windows. Now I inferred from that that if the worship service was less than inspiring, we could sit and bask in the light <laughs> of these glorious windows. And they are, aren't they, glorious windows. So we showed up on your front doorstep. We came in through the port of Cachet out here. The greeters met us, and they were so nice. But we were visitors, kind of standoffish. We came in and sat down in this glorious room right over there. And then worship began. Please don't hear that lightly. Then worship began in this place. The choir and the music was magnificent a blend of, of the traditional and the new, all with very fine theology. The liturgy was led with a vibrant enthusiasm that captivated us and drew us in. Patrick's sermon, Father Patrick's sermon that Sunday was spot on, and he connected with us. Everything in that service said to me, this church is going somewhere, and that somewhere is not backwards. As we were walking out after the recessional, I, I looked at Joanne and I said, well, hon, what'd you think? She said two words. I'm home. I am too, I responded, and we have not been, nor do we anticipate being in another church in the city. This is our home. For us, that morning, Christ Church became number one. Now, we've been here a year and we've found out a lot about you. 
We believe your staff to be very faithful and sincere in their faith. But what's amazing is the amount of energy they bring to their task. We found your choir to be moving and indeed magnificent. The music program here is wonderful. Your education programs are enormously sound, healthy, nurturing programs. But it's your missions program that I have some concerns about. You're only on five continents this morning. <laughs> Africa, North and South America, Europe, and Asia. Don't you care anything about the penguins? <laughs> Seriously, we look at the church and mission begins not just at the front door, they begin in here, in your building, with children from the community, with your tutoring program at James Madison, with your food pantry, all kinds of places that you intersect with this community with the love of Jesus Christ. From that, it's moved to mission programs, you have mission trips like you just heard about from our team that went to Rockport this weekend. Sharing Christ's love in the midst of disaster. Your teams have been literally all over the world and in many of the major cities of our nation. Do you realize, have you thought about it? The sun does not set on the mission work of Christ Church. Somewhere where the sun is shining, anytime, there's mission work going on in the name of this church. Some denominations can't say that. You are indeed a special people. As I, I looked at, we looked at, at what you're doing, we continue to say to ourselves, this is the church where we need to be. So, as I, I was thinking about this ranking in Christ Church number one, rankings also lent itself to the scripture lessons this morning. Last week, the, the pericope, the passage that was supposed to be unused, uh, was a passage dealing with the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus. What they were trying to do is get him to misspeak so that they could either accuse him of blasphemy or of treason. And they started with taxes. They said, Master, is it right that we pay our taxes? Jesus could have said yes and been wrong, or he could have said no and been wrong, so he said neither. He simply asked one of them, show me a coin, and, and they gave him a denarius, not a temple shekel, which they should have. They gave him a denarius. Jesus looks at it and said, whose picture is on this? And they said, Caesar's. And you can see him almost derisively flipping the coin back and says, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. But give to God what's God's. Now that statement is, had impact for me because today is Consecration Sunday. Giving to God what's God is what we're here about today, and it's important. I ask you a simple question. What is God's? That's a rhetorical question. Everything is God's. Many years ago, I was serving on the denominational board of finance, and we had a stewardship specialist come as a consultant. I never forget what he said when he opened his statement. He said, Christian stewardship is everything we do after we say, I believe. I think he must have read C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, every square inch of this universe is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. There is no neutral territory. And we have to decide whose territory it is. God has to be first in our lives. The second passage of Scripture was read this morning. It is one of the most profound passages in all of the New Testament for me. Again, the trap is for Jesus. Master, which is the best commandment in the Ten Commandments? Now Jesus does answer directly. And he answers profoundly so, using words from the Torah to touch them. His first answer is from the Shema, 
Jewish affirmation of faith about God being one and it's found in Deuteronomy. The second one is from Leviticus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, with everything you have. This is the first, the great commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On this is the entirety of the Old Testament. That pushes us, doesn't it? This morning, we're going to talk to you about money. I'm a little nervous about that. That usually has people heading for the door. But it's important that we talk about because what Christ's church is doing is important. And it's worthy of our support, your tasks here. But I ask you, in light of the gospel, where is the good news in saying, we need your money? That sounds just like rather a plea than, than a proclamation of good news. The good news is that when we start looking at the idea that everything is God's and that we worship God with everything we have, it's pretty obvious that one of the things that we have to deal with is money. And in our culture today, that's a big issue. When money is out of order in a life, that life is disjointed and is painful. And the good news is talking about how to put that life back in order by letting God be first. Years ago, I had parents of adult children come to me at the church in Huntsville. They wanted me to teach Dave Ramsey's course on financial peace to their adult children. Obviously, there were some problems. So I did the class, and there were 10, 12 couples in the class. And on the second class setting, it's a rather uncomfortable part of the program. The, the chairs are set in a circle around. And the people began to confess their indebtedness. Now that's tough. It, it started out about like I expected it to start. There were this amount and that amount. But we came around then to one couple, and he sheepishly raised his head and said, my credit card debt is $265,000. Not corporate, not business, personal. How do you do that? How can you run up credit card bill of $265,000? My bank gives me a credit limit of five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? Their life was in crisis as a couple. Their marriage was certainly strained. There was tension with the children. They couldn't even talk to their parents. They got up in the morning with the notion of being enslaved to that debt. And they went to bed at night, but I doubt they slept that much. Over the course of some time with them, they made some difficult and hard decisions and took some serious actions. They sold the house they could not afford. They sold the two new cars, bought used cars, lived in a smaller home, began to take the actions to put their life back in order. And that's when peace, internal peace, walked into that household. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like good news to me. Talking about money is good news. This morning, we're asking you to ex share with us your expected giving for next year. It's, it's an important statement that you do. For when you said and fill that out, you are really saying something else besides I'm going to support Christ Church. You're saying that Everything I have is not for me. And I'm not the center of the universe. God is. It's a pretty simple equation. If you put anything else on God's throne, your life will be in disorder. We were created by Him to live with Him. And so this act that we do this morning 
is pretty serious. Joanne and I have prayed this week about what we're going to do this morning. We're going to make our commitment. You know, I hear that echoing in my ear. Alabama didn't play this weekend, but they're still number one. And that's fine for college athletics. But this morning, we're asking you something else. Is God number one in your life? Well, is he? Is he? Later this morning, Joanne and I expect to have a joyous act together. We'll place our commitment in that bowl. And it's a joy to do it for Christ Church. Won't you join us?